Gina Wurzel. I'm running my staff for nonprofit management here in Los Angeles, and as you about my own mind, um, one of the things that I wanted you to know is that we see about 4,000 nonprofit leaders every year that work on all those tough issues in LA. And since the recession, we've been asking them to talk to policymakers about what works and what doesn't. What I'm concerned about as you think about this is some of the big money issues that you're talking about is kind of the opposite of the problem that we have on the nonprofit side. It's trying to get more out of the money that we have. So um, I was hoping that while you explore this, that if there was anything that we could do to help you hear from nonprofits about any potential consequences of these decisions that you may not understand, um, that we would be happy to help you um, get together with nonprofit organizations. And just wanted, is there a way for nonprofits to reach out to staff? Because I know that's a place where people can really get bang for the buck with the staff. Absolutely. Um, we welcome um, contact from anybody, um, nonprofits, anybody else who might be affected by the lobbying regulations to contact staff. We'd be happy to meet with you um, and, and hear specific concerns that you might want to raise. Well, we'd be happy to convene a group because we see thousands. So um, to get their perspective on anything you're considering, we'd be happy. Nathan Hardy is our director of policy. He's the kind of contact. <laughs> <laughs> Not you. <laughs> well, you can contact me, but he would organize it. Yeah. And I guess for the commission, they could just put their comments in writing, like we've just seen today. And then um, the, the sooner we get them, the better, because then that gives us more time to digest them. So if you guys do convene and have uh, some follow up or identify some issues that you think we need to be brought to our attention, I think the best thing to get from the commission would be to just submitted in writing and before our next meeting so that we have time to review it. And even better if you work with Mr. Hardy because then maybe he can address it and it's already folded into what we can sit for. We can look at anything for right. There's, There's such confusion around lobbying and advocacy and we're trying to make progress in that area and the time is just not working. Do you know how to do you know how to reach him? Oh yeah. Okay. Thank and you so much. Does that address the ground? That's okay. Thank, so. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I have a good follow up to Regina. Uh, I'm the policy director of California Association of Nonprofits, and we are a statewide membership organization. Uh, we have over 10,000 member organizations in the state. And we represent the interests of nonprofits at every level of government and the community at large. Uh, some of this you probably already know, but there are uh, we did a we did a study uh, called Causes County Economic Impact Report on California's nonprofit sector in 2014, and some of what we collected in that was information on all nonprofits in California. Uh, there are about 6,100 nonprofits, 501c3s, in the city of Los Angeles, and that number is growing. They represent every everything that you know. Many of them are grassroots groups. Most of them are small. There are food pantries and community choirs and pet rescues and everything else. And uh, but our study also did uh, an independent survey where we tried to figure out exactly what nonprofits do as part of their mission. And we discovered that most nonprofits, 60 plus percent, engage in some sort of advocacy. They do um, research and public education, but they also meet with public officials. And they mostly do it at the local and city level. So the discussions that you're having around this are particularly germane to, to what nonprofits do. But the problem is that for most nonprofits, although they're very, very aware of their federal requirements, lobbying requirements, they, they probably are pretty unaware of city requirements or that there are actually any city rules at all. I'm the most honest about that. And so that's where we're, we become very interested in this because of course we want all of our nonprofits to do the right thing. And so we would like to make sure that they're able to do that by being as informed as possible. And so my hope for you in going forward in this process that you're in is to have as an inclusive and robust process as possible that includes all of the nonprofits who want to be involved in this process. Um, whether it's in the informational hearings or it's in um, some kind of 
discussion groups or whether it's a working group, but there needs to be some way to do that outreach to bring anybody, everybody in. And, and as Regina Brutzel said, we also at uh, California Association of Nonprofits would be happy to help in any way that we can to make sure that that outreach is done and those public um, meetings happen so that we can get so I'm, I'm hearing a pattern, and um, I, I think it would be really useful, Mr. Hardy, for there to be some. Um, I think on the staff level, because frankly, so many things are worked out before, as everybody knows, before they get to us. And certainly, everybody's always welcome to come and show their concerns with us. Um, but before it even gets to the point where you need to uh, try and rectify something, let's just try and make sure that it's um, we have input from everyone who wants to get input in the first instance. So, and thank also, you very much. Also, just to clarify, I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the comments. So the comments have been mostly focused on concerns that 501c3s would not be aware of the requirements, not so much that there's specific concerns with the policies we have before us today. Yes, because they wouldn't even know that you have the policies before you today. That's that's precisely the problem. So it, it's, it's really both. And I'll just, I mean, we just had a, we recently had a situation where we had a stipulation with a, with a nonprofit who had concerns, or who, who inadvertently hadn't met some of our requirements. And I think what came out of that and has come out of a lot of our stipulations is always unfortunately, you know, ignorance of the law doesn't mean that we don't have to comply. And so I think what I'm hearing is separate and apart from the policy we're considering today, we should, we should focus on outreach to nonprofits, and it sounds like there's two organizations before us today so that we can train people with the policy, whatever that policy may be. Um, but at the end of the day, obviously, everybody, it's on the 501c3's responsibility to become aware of their obligations under the law. That's right, we're totally aware of that. We understand that, we promote that. We have a compliance checklist on our website. We do workshops uh, on compliance, and we, but we know that it's hard to do that without more of a collaboration. Right. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Merlin, can I ask a, uh, an additional clarifying sure. uh, for sure, Don? Is, is the concern not also that it would hinder nonprofits' ability to then advocate because they would somehow be um, not complying with the law? Right. We hear that from our nonprofit members all the time. That they're afraid to get up and speak because they don't know what the rules are. They're hard to understand even if you get copies of them. And so they they aren't sure whether they can speak up on, on an issue or not, so they don't speak at all. And so for this to be as clear as possible with as much outreach as possible means that more of our nonprofits can feel confident in the advocacy that they do. Thank you very much. I just want to apologize in advance for my pronunciation. Shyam Subrab Nayan. You can start by explaining. Sure. Our Hi. Alliance for Justice. Yes, my name is uh, Sham Subramanian, and I'm Southern California Council with Alliance for Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Um, I wanted. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to echo the comments um, Nancy and Regina made about the need for outreach to nonprofit organizations. At the Alliance for Justice, we're an association of over 115 national organizations, and we provide legal support to hundreds of LA area nonprofits, including and especially 501c3 organizations, on the rules of advocacy including the City of Los Angeles' lobbying disclosure rules. And to educate nonprofits, we develop trainings and also plain language materials. And in our experience, uh, as was mentioned before, there is a, a lot of uncertainty, and sometimes full-time employees of 501c3s are unaware of the lobbying disclosure rules, especially if they're not full-time lobbyists, and um, advocate for the city as part of their organizational responsibilities. So we would just request as part of the review process targeted outreach to the 501c3 organizations in the city, as well as uh, a special hearing for these organizations to hear their, their input. And we think that this would um, really be a good way to solicit input from them on their unique role in shaping city policy and to solicit their input. So again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to comment today. 
you know, for an, uh, an employer a lobbyist, the, the organization also has to pay. You know, for many of the organizations that we support, which are small and grassroots, it's a barrier, just to be really honest. I know it doesn't seem like a lot when you think about all the work that you have to do, but, but that's just one example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kravitz, how are you doing tonight? Good morning, guys. My name is Eric Kravitz from the City of City. And I'm very interested in lobbying. I'm very pleased that uh, there's a new guy, Mr. Hardy. I've seen some of his work on the agenda. Diligently and quickly, and I'm glad that we're going we're gonna to listen to his thoughts and to review them. Uh, and I think it's great that uh, members of the not for profit community have come down to raise some concerns. Uh, I have some concerns as well. Um, not for profit is defined as 501c3, and I like the way that it's, if they are trying to lobby on behalf of the advocacy they're doing for people who are in desperate need, they should be given kind of a small exemption. Um, but there are large roles is really big and play big boy baseball. And I just don't want this to be another opportunity to have a little report on how much more influence we're getting from these groups that's going that are kind of down the road. For now, uh, we're really at the bottom, that's the good news. This is finally a little bit of a, a transparency piece, but I do like that. Uh, also in here, though, was how do we define, there are a lot of terms that define, I believe that's the name of the item, defining a lot of these terms. Um, but the central question is, what is a lobbyist? And other jurisdictions, I thought, find it uh, similarly. And you know, I, I took note that uh, for our definition, we need to engage, and this is what's being proposed, I believe, in 30 or more compensated hours of lobbying activity to be considered a lobbyist. Unless, correct me if I'm wrong, you're not a lobbyist. But, but that is a that is a lot of work. I mean, so in other words, if I just came in as a specialist, like Mr. Crow, I'm going to take three minutes, but imagine if I had 15 hours to get this. You know, you would want me to disclose that if I were taking money to get it done, I think. So I just think we have to be cautious. Others define it completely, anyone who receives compensation, you know. So that's kind of the standard that the guys in the back don't like at all, because then they can't slip in little helpers. Um, so that's something to seriously consider. Uh, Chicago also defines the, uh, Two, two, three buzzers from Mr. President, that's a sign of respect. <laughs> um, the legislative administrative matter is kind of a, a benchmark. You know, anything that the council is going to approve or weigh in on is considered something you want. But they have something which is also anything determined by an elected or appointed official. And that opens up a whole other can of reforms that I think we'd like to see with maximum transparency. So uh, that said, uh, the top 10 list in lobbying that we have uh, has not worked at all. The numbers keep getting bigger and bigger, the rich keep getting richer and richer, and nobody knows about it, despite the seasonal article in the newspaper that says, whoa, no, they don't even say it. Nobody knows if England or Konami now is number one or number two every single time, and they can't connect the dots. They pitch England, their uh, council member, and Matt Konami, the son of the supervisor, are linked to that firm because it's just in the bowels of our um, catalog of, of records. So disclosure is good, but we also have to get the word out. And that's why Heather, uh, in this new era, is going to do uh, as much as she can to bring forward this message. And thank you for your time. Great. Thank you for your time. Um, we have one more public comment on item number nine, Mr. Hertz. Thank you. Good morning, Bradley Hertz from the Sutton Law Firm, and here today on behalf of the Los Angeles Lobbyist Association, which is a trade association of lobbying and public affairs professionals in the Los Angeles area. Uh, as an aside, I don't think I've ever heard of lobbying when I was in Happy Place in the same sentence, <laughs> but we'll go with that. Um, as we wrote in our letter of yesterday, um, we have we are pleased with the direction uh, that Mr. Hardy and Mr. Lowe have taken initial phase in terms of definitions, in terms of the transparency of the process, uh, and we agree with the guiding principles and several of the new proposed definitions. We do, however, on behalf of the association, have some concerns. Uh, one is that, the, um, that there be an exploration of whether the threshold should be different 
for in-house lobbyists who are employees of businesses, unions, or nonprofit organizations as compared to contract lobbyists. Uh, the compensation test makes sense when it's a contract lobbyist, in our view, but if it's an in-house employee on a salary, there may very well be a disparate impact uh, when a CEO, as opposed to a lower level employee, spends time and has to calculate a percentage of their salary, uh, there's going to be an inequity there in how much time is spent before the lobbying threshold is met. So we just think there should be uh, acknowledgement of that difference and maybe look at different definitions that might meet that. Uh, secondly is we want to make sure that the appropriate number and quantity quality of exemptions are included uh, when we get to that point. We've attached the San Diego and San Francisco uh, applicable portions of their laws and they have, not, not for the county, but about 19 or 20 categories of exemptions uh, for those who testify at public meetings, those who are involved in adjudicatory proceedings, uh, those who merely are technical, like geologists, etc. Um, and finally, we think land use uh, land use planners and others should be looked at uh, in their own category. Thank you. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I really appreciate the feedback uh, on this issue, and I think lobbying is one of the more complicated and important areas. I think that this is our last big review before, I assume we then start another review because they always take so long um, in our endless review. And so for everyone who spoke, um, it really enhances our ability to think about these issues, and I know that Mr. Hardy has more than enough work ahead of him. Um, so for now, I would say that, um, you know, this is an action item, but what we're asked to do is essentially, again, just kind of conceptually prove this makes sense. Um, please move forward without including any specific language. Um, at this point, I think, um, well, a lot of what I saw here uh, makes sense in terms of changing the threshold from time to money. Um, I think that the charts are helpful in terms of how many people we actually capture here. Um, and I would say that I'm loath to get into too many details because, um, well, I think that we could have an interesting discussion. I think that the details might change once you have hearings with um, members of the public and uh, stakeholders and people who do this on a daily basis and have concerns. So um, my feeling is that we should definitely ask any questions uh, that we have um, with the understanding that this may change. Um, well, I do, I, I actually did question changing from, from the hours to the amount just because Having had some experience uh, working in the government affairs, and uh, I definitely, I definitely agree with with one of the letters that we received about that two thousand kind of being disparate, this, you know, being different between you know the higher paid employees who do this work versus you know people who just kind of do some of the technical stuff that don't necessarily do what I think lobbying is supposed to capture, right? So a lot of so that that's one point, but. Um, so I wanted to get more information about that change and what drove that in, in the 2000s so that I can understand the perspective guiding this. Sure. Uh, well, uh, first and foremost, I think it's important uh, to point out that the, uh, the two letters we received uh, regarding the compensation center are actually supported the $2,000 uh, compensation based threshold. Uh, I know there are some concerns about whether we should do a different standard for in-house uh, lobbyists and happy to discuss that as well uh, and why we arrived at our recommendation. Um, at the outset, I think it's really important to emphasize that uh, going back to 1967, the city of Los Angeles has historically uh, defined uh, who a lobbyist is on the basis of compensation for uh, lobbying services. Uh, that was the case when the city passed its first lobbying ordinance in 1967. It was the case in 1994 uh, when the municipal lobbying ordinance was first adopted. Uh, it changed in 2007. Um, however, in our administration's laws, also just soliciting feedback from the public and the regulated community, uh, one of the things that we've noticed is that the current hourly threshold really poses uh, both a compliance and an enforcement challenge. Uh, one of the 
reasons for that. It's not all organizations keep track of these hours. Uh, and so may not have that ready to hand. Uh, another concern is just uh, from an accountability uh, standpoint that it can be really difficult uh, for staff to prove that someone's met that hourly threshold, um, which in turn makes it more difficult to ensure that everybody's playing by the same set of rules. And I know that's one of the concerns in particular that we've heard from regulated community and, and people who do uh, lobby the city uh, because that is uh, something that is uh, by activity. It's uh, not something to, to be cleaned or you know, lobbying is, is a First Amendment right. Um, one of the things that our law recognizes and tries to do is you know, ensure that those regulations are reasonable. And one of the things that we frequently hear from the regulated community is that, you know, hey, I, I register, I play by the rules, but you know, I, I see some guys at these meetings, they're clearly lobbying the city, but they're not, they're not registered. Uh, we think one of the reasons for that is uh, is the hourly threshold, which we think that moving, uh, returning to the city's uh, historic use of a compensation based standard will both help to ensure compliance uh, and also ensure uh, greater transparency and accountability. So then the 2000 came from like that specific amount. Oh. Because I, I feel like 2000 doesn't match with what 30 hours would be, if that makes sense, right? Oh, I see. So I feel like that's that's kind of what I, I, I don't understand. So 30 hours or more, if you take an, I don't know what an hour, I mean, I know lobbyists make a lot of hours, so 2,000 definitely is probably not covering that. And then if it was to intended to capture a lot of in-house people, then I think that would be more of a reasonable amount. But, so that's, that's why the 2,000 kind of stood out to me because it feels like I, I don't know what a lot of these, like, what would they make, like, on the low end, like, a couple hundred dollars, and on the high end, maybe, like, a thousand, so that's, that's just maybe two hours of work for them, right? Versus we used to allow them to do 30 over a three-month period. Well, with respect to how we arrived at the $2,000 figure, uh, specifically, one of the things we looked at is the data about uh, how much firms are reporting receiving in compensation. We also looked at how much um, clients are spending in the year, we looked at data from uh, the last year in 2015, and we saw that moving, uh, number one, moving to a standard of $2,000 um, will, we think, again, help to ensure compliance and enforceability, um, and, in, and in turn, fortify public accountability. But one of the other things I think that uh, is an added benefit of moving to a $2,000 threshold is that it has the, has the benefit of aligning the city's lobbying disclosure threshold with campaign finance laws. Uh, currently, California state law says that you know if you're spending two thousand dollars in an election, the public has a right to know about uh, about those activities. And essentially, it says that you know it's, it's a level of significance at which uh, we consider important enough to say that the public has a right to know. We think that it makes sense because both sets of laws, lobbying and campaign finance, serve to inform the public about who's spending money to try to influence government action. Uh, we believe that those standards should marry each other, and we think that's an added benefit as well. And uh, lastly, I would just add that uh, standard, establishing a standard of uh, $2,000 reflects our historic view that not every person engaged in lobbying activity should be subject to regulation, recognizes that there should be a balancing. Um, and in looking at the data uh, that we proposed on page four of item nine, just showing the different lobbying firm compensation ranges, uh, I think one of the overwhelming points that take away from that is that by and large establishing a two thousand dollar threshold standard it's likely not going to have uh, much of an effect on those who are currently registered as lobbyists but i think what it will do is clarify who should and should be reporting um, and ultimately that's i think what any any good balance threshold will do i guess I, i'll just i do appreciate your explanation on the hours versus two thousand and i think that it's, I, I, I think that's a really valid point that it makes it easier to comply. I'm still not 100% sold on the 2000 mark just because I think there's a big difference in uh, you know, giving money to get somebody elected is different to me than you know, the, that lobbying that I think most people do. And, and having been involved um, 
both working, you know, for an elected official and then also working at a nonprofit trying to, you know, advocate for an issue. Um, just two thousand dollars is is not realistic. I mean, I just think that's a really, really low threshold, and I think that that I understand the purpose of lobbying, and I think that we want transparency. But I think that there's a lot of advocacy work that gets done that I know counts as lobbying, but really it's like informing our elected officials. Unfortunately, our elected officials have to make a lot of decisions on information that they don't have an expertise on, and sometimes it is. Um, through lobbying, through through lobbying, that they get accurate information, and that's that's just sadly, I think, the reality of how decision making happens. And so, I just want to make sure that we don't uh, limit we limit expertise from getting to our elected officials when they make decisions. And I do want there to be transparency, but I just don't want it to be so overwhelming that or scary that people who would otherwise have engaged in a conversation just don't because it seems too burdensome. Well, I, I think it's important to, in, in noting those concerns and addressing them adequately, I think it's important to just point out the context that uh, regarding the threshold of $2,000, uh, one, again, it reflects the city's historic view that you know, this should be based on the compensation standard. Uh, two, I, I would just point out that other jurisdictions, including New York City, apply a compensation standard across the board uh, in New York City, uh, their compensation uh, definition is, the definition is, is broad, but registration is requiring a point of uh, $5,000 on an annual basis. And uh, we think that uh, $5,000 we thought would be a little little high for the city of Los Angeles when we look at the data. Uh, because we want to ensure that, uh, one, you know, we want to make sure that it's reasonable what we're proposing. Uh, but we also want to make sure that it's, it's capturing uh, the level of activity that historically we deem that's important. And looking at who qualifies under the current hourly threshold, uh, one of the things that we really took away was that the 2000 seemed to, the 2000 mark really seemed to uh, uh, hit the nail on the head, so to speak, as far as being uh, well balanced and accurate, and making sure that we're not losing anything when we move to a compensation-based standard. We certainly don't want uh, the public and residents of the city to lose out on any information on uh, who's trying to lobby the city, who's trying to spend money to influence government action. With respect to the concerns about the advocacy work, I think those are legitimate, and I would like to emphasize that today is just the beginning. Uh, it's this the first of many discussions, and uh, I'm certainly uh, pleased to hear from all the feedback from the representatives from the various nonprofit organizations. I think they'll be pleased to know that one of the things we're, we're recommending in this proposal is uh, a categorical exemption for nonprofits that provide uh, social service, human services at uh, less than market value. That's a slight expansion uh, regarding the current categorical exemption that is in place. Uh, so I, I think they'll be pleased to know that we're actually recommending uh, expanding that slightly. Uh, I would also just like to note that as far as the other concerns, which I think are inherent in your concerns about advocacy and and lawmakers getting information because that, that is a legitimate need. Um, I think it's also important to emphasize uh, that regarding the broader list of uh, exemptions that uh, may very well apply when we arrive at a greater consensus around, around these issues, is that today we're just discussing what's, what's in our current report represents what we believe should be categorical exemptions, people that should be completely exempt from the provisions of the municipal body ordinance. However, uh, other activities that people have noted, such as uh, you know, testifying in a public hearing, um, other suggestions like that, you know, those are things that we're going to look at down the road. Uh, so this, this is certainly not intended to be uh, the only discussion of that issue. Uh, you know, really, this is just to start that process. And I think that moving to a compensation-based threshold will, um, one, in, encourage greater compliance, make it clear who's subject to the law and who shouldn't be. Also, I think it will be uh, more transparent and uh, provide better disclosure to the public. But I think also, also it's important to emphasize because this is just the beginning, uh, this is just the first of several conversations that I, I think we can address those concerns about providing information, various things, kinds of activities in the past um, should be exempt from those provisions. We can address those later meetings, as well as concerns um, regarding registration fees and, and things like that. 
speak Spanish. So I'm definitely, um, you, I'm definitely in support of moving towards compensation, and we don't have to continue discussing it. I don't have it at this point for the 2000, but I will say before I can vote to support the 2000, I would like to see more of that data because what I heard you say is that most of the lobbying kind of far exceeds that. So if we raised it a bit, I still feel like we're going to capture a lot of it. And I've seen our lobbying reports, and it tends to be the same big people, and it's same, you know. So I think, um, so, so to get me a 2000, I have to see data that shows that you know if we didn't do 2000, we were going to lose a big amount of people. But I think if we went a little higher, we'd still be okay. And it, it sounds like New York's been fighting at 5,000, so even that already seems like it could be something to concern on that. Well, so, so, that, so, so that's all I'm saying. We'll look at that. When, you're, when we come with a specific number, that's what I, that, just so you know that's where I'm going to be looking. In the same way you convinced me to go on the compensation way, I, I, I could very likely be convinced to do 2,000, but I'm going to need more information on that. We need to get to our happy places for her. It's ultimately on well, that, that, that's where, uh, you know, that's what we're here to do today. <laughs> I just want to echo Commissioner Gahan's concern, and I would love to see data on how we went from $4,000 in compensation per quarter to $2,000 per year. Before I was able to. And um, I have another question. Um, so, when, when we're looking at the exemptions for nonprofits that provide uh, life assistance to um, underserved clients, is that is that direct service or would that be um, civil rights sort of overarching policies? Because I know a lot of the advocacy that gets done, there are no programs that um, organizations necessarily have in, have in place, but they are um, they're advocating for communities that would be directly affected by policies to be there. Well, um I'm glad you pointed that out. One of the things, uh, again, as you point out, in our current recommendation, which is in modifying the exemptions so that it applies to any 501c3 organization that provides basic life assistance uh, directly to disadvantaged individuals, um, either free of charge at a below market rate or based on their income or ability to pay. Uh, I think one of the rationales underlying that, uh, that proposal is that we don't want to penalize groups, say, uh, for instance, I know we had a speaker from public council, and I know one of the things that they do is provide uh, services to indigent clients, but uh, I believe uh, organizations like them often charge uh, a minimal fee as a result of that, and there are good reasons to do so. Um, we wouldn't certainly want to discourage that sort of activity that's good social activity, um, and we don't think that necessarily that specific type of work or advocacy uh, should necessarily fall within scope of the city's lobbying laws. So I think to address your question uh, more directly, I, I would say our current language and proposal uh, concerns organizations that provide this assistance directly uh, to this group uh, of individuals. Uh, but I think that as far as your uh, kind of overarching concerns, big picture concerns about that, that advocacy, I, I believe could be addressed and we're you know, looking at more specific language uh, down the road. Great. I'm just, I'm thinking about, um, for instance, in the, in the past we were looking at a $15 an hour living wage for the city and maybe it, it would have the implications of, of impacting those those people who are underserved, but maybe um, those organizations aren't necessarily providing a direct service on a day-to-day -day basis like public council. Uh, well, I think it's also important to um, to keep in mind that issue advocacy uh, issue advocacy can constitute lobbying, and, and uh, nonprofit organizations are uh, currently subject uh, to the lobbying ordinance, we do have a categorical exemption that some of them meet. Uh, we are recommending expanding that slightly. Um, and as I think Heather mentioned, I'm certainly happy to, to meet with these groups, to have discussions, or to meet with anyone, uh, for that matter, to discuss these laws. Um, but I think one of the also important uh, concerns that we have is, is to make sure that those who are expending significant sums of money, whether it's for 
what we might deem a good cause or a bad cause. I think it's important to ensure that the laws apply equally uh, to all players. Um, and so I, I think your concern about issue advocacy, I, I think some of that, uh, I have to say, looks a lot like uh, lying in a, in a certain context. But uh, you know, of course, it would really just depend on the specific group and issue what, what you're talking about. And just one more. So let's say we move forward with this language and we said the threshold was $2,000. Um, how does that sort of manifest? How would it affect nonprofits? Would they, they would then have to register as a lobbyist um, to reporting? Would they then also have to change their overall or add a, an additional tax ID? So would they become a 501c4 as well? No. Well, first of all, I, I would like to, to again emphasize the conceptual nature of uh, the recommendations that we're proposing today. Um, so I think for the most part, the, a lot of these concerns are, are going to be addressed at, at future meetings, and it's impossible to address it uh, completely in one meeting. Uh, and, and that's why we have these discussions. That's, that's the purpose of these meetings. I think that as far as 501c3 organizations it, it, uh, and nonprofit groups, Again, we are recommending uh, a categorical exemption that would be slightly uh, larger in scope than the one we currently have in place, which I think uh, will be good news uh, for those who are interested in that. Um, I, I also, though, think it's, it's important to emphasize that uh, if, if you're lobbying on a matter and, and you reach that compensation threshold, it's, it's important that if the laws apply equally to everyone uh, so that we're not singling groups out and so that uh, we're making sure that everybody is playing by the same set of rules, uh, regardless of who's on the side. Serena, I think to answer your question, I think what you're getting to, is I think that in general, 501c3s have a limitation on their advocacy. Mm -hmm. So I think it's separate and apart from our rules. So um, if anything, this might just provide more transparency for them in terms of their own 501c3 tax compliance. But I do think what you're raising is Oftentimes, I think 501c3s are more like conveners, and they uh, act to, you know, get individuals who wouldn't otherwise have access to elected officials or understanding of issues. And so, I think, I guess, our questions are kind of around. Okay, so we understand that they're directly advocating for something, and that's going to benefit a program that they have. But let's say, in general, they care about as. Serena mentioned, you know, this, this $15 wage increase, minimum wage increase. If they were letting their members know, helping set up meetings, but at the end of the day, was there individual members who showed up and spoke to that elected official, or they collected the letters and then they mailed in the letters? Or on the flip side, they distributed the address and told people who they needed to contact. Would that qualify as lobbying under our policy? Well, first of all, I think if, if you go back to our, if you go to the report and if you look at in our definitions on page five, five and nine, uh, where we propose a new definition for uh, the definition of lobbying organization, uh, our laws currently refer to entities as in-house, uh, in-house in lobbyist employers, or termed just that, lobbyist employers. Uh, and we also have an entity under the current law called Major Fiber. Uh, now currently Major Fiber refers to persons who spend at least $5,000 in a calendar quarter to attempt to influence the city matter of public relations, media relations, public outreach, and similar activities of that nature. Um, because the MLO expressly provides that the citizens of the city have a right to know the identity and interests that attempt to influence decisions of city government and the means employed by those interests, uh, these persons both are in subject uh, to the laws uh, and, as they speak. Can we, can we clarify who these persons are? Uh, sure. So I'm talking about the major filing provision currently in uh, the city's municipal law ordinance. But in the, I guess sorry, in the scenario I gave you, would that be the nonprofit? Is that who you're referring to? Yes. So the nonprofit who spends its money organizing its members or individuals or whoever citizens to come speak that would they would then qualify under this provision so under this provision yes um what we what we are proposing is that if you spend two thousand dollars uh, whether you're a corporation 
uh, a nonprofit organization or, uh, or just a person, if you're spending $2,000 uh, on media relations, public, uh, public relations, advertising, things of that nature, uh, to influence the city matter, uh, you're going to spend that level. Uh, we think it's fair that we're going to subject uh, lobbyists to a $2,000 uh, threshold that those entities should be required to register with lobbying organizations. Uh, because essentially, that's what lobbying is, is attempting to influence the city matter. Um, and again, the current provisions in the NLO and the principles that uh, are enumerated in section 48, 4801B um, speak to the guiding principles of the laws. And, and those persons are currently subject to, uh, to the law if they spend uh, $5,000 be a major fiber under our current provision. Uh, we're simply recommending that we return that in a more streamlined and intuitive approach by finding a lobbying organization to include both uh, in-house, both organizations that employ lobbyists in-house and persons who spend a certain amount of money in an attempt to influence city action. So uh, spending you know $5,000, for instance, on a raise the wage campaign, spending $5,000 uh, on a campaign to get tax breaks or any any related matter, any attempt to influence the city matter uh, that meets that you know, spending threshold, uh, we, we would deem that uh, activity that should be categorized uh, under under the provision of, of what we call the lobbying organization. And one of the reasons that we differentiate that and we believe it makes sense to group these two groups together is that in contrast the lobbyists and the lobbying firms that receive money to influence action. Lobbyist employers and major fibers spend money to influence action. We believe it's appropriate, but therefore, they treat them similarly uh, as lobbyist organizations. Okay. So, when I when I think about the fifteen dollar an hour a wage or a lot of other sort of equity issues, they're ongoing issues, they're ongoing conversations. Um, I guess my concern is if that's not the crux of the core focus of an organization, and most of their efforts are focused on education or convening, surely someone like an organizer in an organization who's bringing people together over the course of a year is going to make $2,000 in, in their salary. Would they then, an organizer who is definitely not in what I think of it in the category of lobbyists, would they then be for the register? I'll just jump in here and say that that person would only be required to register if, in addition to doing the organizing and earning $2,000 in a year, also had a direct contact with a city official in an attempt to influence um, that particular matter. So that person, if someone is simply behind the scenes at an organization and they're being paid to send out communications to members and that kind of thing, that would not qualify unless that person also had a direct contact with the city official. Does that contact include calling their scheduler and scheduling the meeting for? No, we do, and I think Nathan has mentioned this, that we haven't put in front of you yet um, exempted activities. We okay. only present the categorical exemptions, but ministerial actions like Okay. Scheduling a meeting, that's that would not be considered. Um, okay, I mean, I, I, I guess the only so the same way I was questioning earlier, like, and I asked for the, the that exemption for people who get $25 and that would make them the, the top 10. I also feel like you know, part of why the public wants a lobby is because they feel like um, there's just money allowed a certain group to have more influence in our decision-making process and in our government and I feel unfortunately when you don't have that, those resources as an individual then your best way of accessing government and having influence is through some kind of uh, you know leveraged grouping and I think 501c3 operates to do that I also know and believe that people have taken advantage of 501c3 laws I also know that there are some I think our public speaker Eric Previn mentioned that there are some really major nonprofits that that probably go above and beyond and than what we're, we're thinking about. So I would just say that this may also go back to that space of the 2000 where I was concerned about, where I thought, okay, so maybe we'll keep these definitions, but maybe we'll try to use the 2000 to allow some nonprofits who do this work but not at that large scale. You know, to, to have a little bit of space to, to do what I think is important, which is, 
you know, leverage the, the, the small groups of people who don't otherwise have a voice unless they come together. And unfortunately, coming together always costs money. Yeah, and, and I understand that. I, I'll just add for the record that I myself have been an organizer before. So I, I completely understand the angle uh, that you're coming from. And I think, I think it's important just to say for clarity at the outset that you know, we're not trying to, these proposals aren't, aren't intended to, certainly to capture um, every, uh, especially the minor, the small scale grassroots activity. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is one, make sure that everybody has uh, subject to the same set of rules. Uh, we want to make sure that our suggestions and policy proposals are reasonable. We want to make sure they're balanced. Uh, we want to make sure they're fair. Um, and we also want to make sure that if uh, spending, if groups are spending significant amounts of money influence city action. We, we think the public has a right to know about that. Uh, one of the things that uh, you alluded to, uh, Mr. Preben alluded to, is that there are certain uh, nonprofit groups who have, uh, you could argue, abused uh, some of those rules. And, and that's one of the reasons uh, that the state ended up passing some of the legislation that it did regarding dark money, because there were groups uh, essentially hiding money and funneling it. Uh, through different channels to avoid public disclosure. Um, and we want to make sure, uh, one, that we're not creating those sort of loopholes or bad incentives in our lobbying laws. But uh, more importantly, to just capture that, uh, you know, if you're engaged in a specific, in a, in a significant amount of spending money, if you're spending a significant sum of money, we, we think the public has a right to know that. That's fully consistent uh, with a provisions and guiding principles enumerated in the law itself. Uh, and we believe that this is a good proposal that will improve upon the current provision, uh, the major five provision, and, and bring it into a more in, intuitively, a more streamlined definition, uh, and help uh, clarify who's subject to the law and who's not. I think one of the things that I hear repeatedly coming up in this discussion in the public comments, I think will largely be addressed when we discuss the definition of lobbying activities. And one of the reasons that we decided to go uh, with a conceptual meeting here uh, to begin this first conversation is just to try to reach some consensus around who's a lobbyist, who's a lobbying firm, what's a lobbying organization. Um, and then once we achieve that consensus, uh, I think then at that point it would make more sense to really work and see you know, what, should be, uh, what should constitute the definition of lobbying activities. Yeah, I agree, and I think we're just giving you feedback, and I, I think we're all on the same page conceptually, but I think the devil in the details, and I think that there's some good, we, it seems like there's some concern about nonprofits, and so in what you presented, I'm seeing two ways in which we might address. One would be maybe the 2,000 amount, and then the other for later, because we haven't seen any specifics, will be um, towards the fees, right? So we, I think we all agree there should be transparency, but then there's that barrier. If, if they're gonna have to register as a lobbyist and it's gonna be $450 and then all the costs of tracking and hiring counsel for, you know, whoever it is that advises them on the filing of their reports, those are extra costs that this nonprofit's now taken. So make, just something to be aware of and when we look at that next aspect of the process, how can we, we'll allow for transparency, but maybe we'll have some kind of tiered some, something else that addresses this issue that I think we've heard everybody raise. Yeah, and we're, we are happy. Well, one, I think it's sufficient to say I'm excited. I think we're excited to begin this discussion now and recognize that this is going to be the first of many discussions, and, and we're certainly happy to address those issues. I'm sorry, I, I know we spent a lot of time on the 501c3s. I do want to say that I uh, am interested in the the, the, the land use issue, the only because, and I'll just disclose, I do live on, I just purchased a house that's on city property, and I know we have a homeowners association, and we've had some issues that we're gonna have to talk to the city about, and so I think, you know, I'm just curious to see what activities, if, if the, our association had to hire a lobbyist to get us access to be able to identify, address some like technical issues on our property, that just raised an issue to me, and I didn't even know that that was an issue. So I, I would be curious to see. I, again, I think there's a difference between like homeowners having an issue with the property versus like a developer, right? And so I just I don't know enough to know about the land use process, but that triggered something in my mind that I just wanted to 
know if that was an issue, I should be worried about it as a citizen and property owner in the city of Los Angeles. Absolutely not, don't worry. Um, but we do appreciate Mr. Hertz's offer to um, uh, facilitate conversations about that particular issue. That would be very helpful, so thank you. because I think things may change. But, um, I think the discussion is really productive. Are there any other comments or questions before we essentially prove almost nothing at all? Uh, but conceptually, uh, thank you for your time and uh, conceptually approved recommended definitions with the understanding that they uh, may all be changed. Um, so, so I would move to um, to do so to improve the recommendations in the top of Okay, okay. all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. And thank you for um, everyone who came out to give public comments. And I do uh, hope and encourage that you'll speak with Mr. Hardy and the staff. And, um, you know, there, we may all be able to get to our happy place very quickly. Um, we have, the, that concludes the action items for today.